Welcome, everyone. Oh, man, it's wonderful to see such a good crowd here um, for our panel on stories and technology and new forms of narrative and where it's all going. Uh, I am going to do some quick introductions so you know who you're hearing from, and then we're going to kick off a conversation here. We've got 50 minutes, which, you know, sometimes 50 minutes seems like a yawning eternity. Uh, in this case, I actually think we're going to be really strapped to cover the ground we want to cover in that time because there's a lot of it. I would love to have some time for questions at the end, um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to create that buffer. I'm just going to tell you ahead of time that I'm pretty mean as a panel moderator, and uh, I don't want any questions that are filibusters or you know pitches for your theories. Let's take advantage of the fact that we've got three really smart people uh, gathered here, and so if you hear something in our conversation that makes you go, well, what about this, what about that? I think that's the kind of thing that's going to be most generative and most interesting. Um, and so hopefully we can make time for a few of those at the end of our 50 minutes. So um, let me just introduce quickly uh, the other folks at this table. Immediately to my right, we've got Lise Quintana. She, uh, she's an editor and a startup founder, and she oversees sort of a, a group of things that are all braided together. There's a company called Narrative Technologies that produces an app, sort of a platform called Lithomobilis. Did I say that right? Yep. Um, and one of the sort of marquee magazines or pieces of content on Lithomobilis is a journal called the Non-Binary Review. Uh, you can get Lithomobilis on your iPhone or iPad, and we're going to hear more about it from Lise in a minute. Um, then we've got Eli Horowitz. He was managing editor, then publisher of McSweeney's, uh, the great Bay Area publishing institution. Um, after that, he produced, with various collaborators, the next generation app novels. What do we call them? That's kind of why we're here, to figure that out. Uh, the Silent History, The New World, and the forthcoming Pickle Index, and uh, just to prove that he um, can do stuff solo too, he wrote a book about ping pong. <laughs> and finally, we've got Russell Quinn um, on the end of the table, who I'm going to make sort of a bold claim, actually, and say that Russell is probably the world's foremost developer, designer and developer, of bespoke digital books. Uh, he collaborated with Eli on um, Silent History, The New World, and The Pickle Index. He's also made other apps of his own. Uh, he's made work for the web. And he collaborated um, on the world's best mugs retelling episodes of Breaking Bad using emoji characters. <laughs> that category is slightly less competitive than the others, but it's still a distinction. And uh, I'm Robin Sloan. I wrote a novel called Mr. Penumbra's 24-Hour Bookstore. Um, which is actually about a lot of the things that we're going to talk about here. So if you find this panel interesting, you could always uh, seek it out and read it. So I want to begin really quickly just to set the stage and kind of situate what these folks are doing here uh, with an experience I had recently. I was in New York at an exhibit at the Grolier Club in Manhattan where they had assembled for the 500th anniversary of Aldous Minutius's death. This is the great Renaissance publisher, Aldous Minutius. A huge collection of his books in this room about this size. And going through that room, you saw all these books and the little placards next to them saying things like, in this book, Aldous Minutius used italics for the first time in history. Or this book was the first pocket-sized book in history. <laughs> and on and on and on. And it made you realize that all these things we take for granted in books today, you know, printed books, as being comfortable and organic and wonderful and nourishing, these things were invented by particular people at a particular place at a particular time. So if you fast forward to today, 2015, instead of 1515, it stands to reason that we are inventing those things today. Those modes and features and ways of reading and ways of kind of dreaming on the page of the screen that are going to feel so comfortable and nourishing and rich and like be such amazing canvases for human creativity, people are inventing those today. In fact, it's these people and others like them, their peers, that are inventing them. So that's pretty exciting to have the latter day Aldous Minutiuses sitting at this table. So um, with that, with that, um, I'd like to start, and this is going to help also kind of, kind of the, the folks here understand what it is you guys do and, and what, the, what shape your work takes. I would love to just go down the line here and ask each of you um, in just a couple sentences what you've written, published, developed, designed in the last couple of years that you're the most proud of? I mean, we're talking with three prolific creators here, so there's a lot to choose from. But if you had to point people in this room to kind of like one thing and say, oh, and look at it this way, you know, pay attention to this characteristic, because I think it's the coolest thing, what would it be? 
and we'll start with you, Lise. Oh. Okay, gosh. It's funny because although I am an author, um, I, the stuff that I write is just regular linear fiction, although the platform that I created is for multi-threaded non-linear fiction. And the thing that I'm the most proud of is that, as you said, the platform that, that we are creating now really makes modes of narrative possible that people are thinking of now. Um, you know, I go to different things and people say, oh, I wish that somebody could publish my you know, big weird story, we can. And we can do that now and it wasn't possible five years ago. And I, that's what I'm most excited about. Uh, for me, I guess it was a project that we collaborated on with two other writers, Matt Derby and Kevin Moffat, called The Silent History, um, which I guess is the project that got us here. That's just a long, sprawling novel. It was us trying to imagine what would a novel be if it was inherently digital. And so it's serialized over six months in daily installments. And then there's other parts of the story that you can explore by being at the physical location where the story took place. So it's like a walking tour of the fictional world using the, the physical world as a set. Hello. Um, yeah. Um, I guess just to um, expand on that, um, I guess I'm most proud of um, the fact that we make these projects um, in such a small team, um, like the conception, the development, the writing, uh, the promotion, the marketing, um, it's fun to do it in a, a small and tight team. I want to I want to build on that, actually. That's a wonderful bridge um, to kind of talk about how these projects begin. I mean, these are definitively not traditional publishing projects, or even the kind of traditional publishing projects that begin with a book and then get handed off to, you know, some poor sort of downtrodden developer and the publisher says, make it interactive, you know, that's a terrible assignment. Um, these are things that begin, these are things that begin in, a, I think, a, a more kind of um, a, a, a wholer way. And so I'm curious to actually ask, um, you know, this is a panel about story and technology and another way of saying that is content and form. And so, um, and maybe we'll, we'll actually come down the other way now and I'll, we'll start with, with Russell and Eli. I'm curious to know if you can generalize or, or, or maybe there's a difference between your different projects. Have they begun with a big idea for the content and then you do the work to kind of build the form to support it? Or has it been the opposite where you imagine this wonderful, beautiful vessel and then find ways to fill it with, with words? Or option C that's not either of those things? For, for silent history, it definitely was the form first. Okay. We thought, or at least we thought we had the form. We had a belief about the form, a kind of shape for the novel, that then actually turned out to be really useful as a generative device for the, the story elements. Um, so it sort of needed to be a story that would focus on individuals, but also have a broad geographic sweep. So that's how it turned out to be sort of an epidemic story, because that worked on this human level, but larger level. Uh, and on and on, a lot of little decisions like that. But then it also went backwards. It wasn't like we actually had this full building mapped out that we just had to furnish. We thought we knew like the general shape of the house, but then as you write the story, it pushes back. And I think, like you're saying, that back and forth is what's really fundamental to these projects. And having a kind of team where the two parts are evolving together and in intense communication rather than being handed off, because that's so often like the kiss yeah. of death for these things, in either direction. Yeah. It's either handed off and make this interactive, or I made this whole thing, now you go write a thing for it, put a story in there, mm -hmm. and then you can, you can feel that either way. Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so there was lots of just... Um, like ideas, and then we would have like a back and forth on, um, is this possible, or um, like will this feature uh, that fits in with the story take like six months to make or a week? Um, so just like figuring out what was possible to make between us. Huh. Um, yeah, so lots of back and forth. And the fact, and the fact that you, your team, has has those skills, those skills to actually produce new, you know, code, write new code, and produce mm -hmm. new technology. That's essential, right? I mean, if you if you were working with a a piece of software that had features A, B, and C, um, and you kind of it didn't have that literacy, you wouldn't be able to, to do that process. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, both. So, I mean, like if you're writing in code or you're working on a platform, then both have like constraints. Um, and um, like in some ways, the constraints of the platform can make an interesting story too. Um, but then, yeah, I'm mean, like having like the freedom 
um, that the freedom to build almost anything in code is interesting too. But just sorry to add on that really quick, sorry, yeah. is that it wasn't just the skills of the people, but also sort of the um, atmosphere of collaboration and trust. Because so often the way these things work is the different divisions have to kind of defend their territory and almost obfuscate on purpose to create a sort of sense of control and power. So like the production department, this happens in normal publishing too, the production department is like, you can't make a book like that. The design department is like, you can't use a font like that. Yeah. The, edit, the marketing is like, we can't put that in the cover. And it's in order to retain the sense of control. And then, so by not having that, we are able to have the conversations of like, is that going to take six months or a week? And like, well, come on, just do it anyway. Or I really can't. And then just and working that out. Yeah. What about you, Lisa? What comes first, uh, former content, or neither or both? Uh, um, so neither <coughs> and both. Um, I I was working on a very big story, and and it had a lot of points of view, et cetera. And I actually went to an event in Santa Cruz called Tech Raising, where. Um, people with an idea get up in front of an audience that's composed of developers and business advisors and VCs. They pitch their idea on a Friday night, and then um, at the mingler afterwards, if developers, et cetera, are interested in, in helping you, you know, create that idea, they'll, they'll approach you. You form a team. You have the weekend to put together a prototype, and then everybody demos their stuff on Sunday afternoon. And so I got up and said, you know, I want to change what literature looks like. I want to change how this works and sort of described, you know, this multi-threaded, being able to change the story, having, enriching the conversation. We talk about literature being a conversation between the author and the reader, enriching the reader's part of that conversation. Um, and there were developers that were super excited about it. And you know, when, when we, as we flesh the thing out, and a lot of it is, you know, answering those business questions, you know, how is it in the experience? How is this particular action going to work? Um, having people that were genuinely excited, and every single person that we talked to about it said, oh my gosh, do you realize that you could also do this thing with it? And so as we move forward, like, trying to preserve as much flexibility so that other people, you know, my dream is that there's the way I see this platform working, and then somewhere out there is somebody who's going to use it in some completely new and surprising way. And I find that incredibly exciting. Yeah. I find that, you know, I'm, I'm waiting for that person to come along and yeah. just shock me with the inventive use to which it can be put. The, the Joyce of uh, Litho Mobilist. <laughs> um, I want to talk about the content piece of it a little bit, um, the things that you, that you fill these machines with, because there's actually a very interesting... Um, uh, both teams here um, take very different approaches in what I think is a very provocative way. So, of course, um, we have these new systems and they're exciting, but uh, there's a bit of a tax on them because we all know exactly how to read a print book. Um, we've been, it occurred to me the other day that people who pr publish books are the beneficiaries of this like vast state-funded system to produce customers for books. Like there's not, they don't, they don't like have kids in elementary school read, play video games, at least not yet. Um, uh, but they always have them read books, which is awesome. So everyone knows how to read a book, and we are the beneficiaries of that. These digital things, of course, can be a little more challenging in a way that, is, that can be very productive, but um, it means that sometimes it's helpful to make other parts of it easier or more inviting. And it occurs to me least that in your work with the Nonbinary Review, um, this magazine that sort of lives on um, Lithomobilis, uh, every issue is keyed to something that's actually very familiar. Um, it'll be, you know, one issue will be uh, The Wizard of Oz, and then what you read in the issue is sort of that core story, almost as if you, like, shined it through a prism, and it kind of refracts and splinters apart, and you read all these different things. But the core of it is something very familiar, and then I would go like, oh, Wizard of Oz, dig that, I'm in. Whereas um, the project that you guys have put together have been all new. Like, these are new worlds, new mythologies. Um, you haven't, um, you've chosen not to kind of bootstrap with, um, with familiar stuff. And both of those strike me as actually very um, specific and interesting decisions. So I'd like to hear, well, maybe, first of all, am I right? Is, were those, was that a, a specific decision, a real strategy? Like, this is, this is weird, so we're going to make at least one part of it familiar. Um, how do you think that's worked out? And then, well, and we'll, I'll, I'll move down to Eli and Russell in a minute. But Lise, you first. Um, are, you, so, are you as smart as I think, as I think you are? <laughs> no, I'm way smarter than that. Oh, my god. Um, uh, so really, it was it was 
strictly a business decision. Like oh. Eli had touched on earlier about how you make this beautiful, precious thing and 12 people read it because, you know, it, there's getting the word out, there's getting people, the word out to people who have the right device, to people who are engaged with reading your kind of thing, people who, you know, have access and want to go out and do this thing. Um, and for us, um, how many people are going to want to download this to read, you know, my story? Well, yeah, all of you and everyone you know and, like, your families and your tennis partners and all of that. <laughs> but that's still a finite number of people. Um, but lots of people, you know, like, love... We started out with Grimm's fairy tales. Lots of people love Grimm's fairy tales. Lots of people love um, mythology. We did a Bullfinch's mythology issue. And the, the thing that was important to us wasn't just having those texts, but having modern responses to those texts. Because the other thing was, you know, give people something that they already know and add to that something new. And as, as editors, we knew that practically every author of short fiction and poetry in the world has something for, you know, Grimm's fairy tales, you know, was what a classic, has some kind of take on a classic text. So it was going to be easy to get people to collaborate and, and write with us. So it was a, also in some ways a recruitment strategy. Absolutely. That's interesting. Um, I, I, yeah, I'm, I'm quite compelled by the strategy. And, and I'll just throw out another kind of data point for folks who are interested in this kind of work. There's a, I guess it's technically a game for iPhones and Android phones called 80 Days. I think it's one of the most stunning pieces of you know, work in this realm of like interesting ways to tell stories. It's, it plays out kind of like a game. It's actually quite complicated. You have to figure out a lot of things as you go, but it, as the title maybe implies, is based on, it's kind of a, a remix or a reimagining of Around the World in 80 Days, the Jules Verne classic. And so, again, you, you kind of, that kind of gets you in the door. You're like, okay, I know that, and I know that's cool, and that's part of our culture, so I will perhaps afford this weird thing, the patience, and I'll actually take the time to, to kind of learn all the fiddly bits and then have a, have a great experience. But you guys, you have foregone all of those advantages and said, no, you're gonna be into the silent history. You're gonna, you're gonna get down with the pickle index. Um, and I'm just curious to know, have, how, did, how did you arrive there with the idea of something right. wholly new? I mean, that, definitely that broader question is, is very much, that tension between the new and the old is very much a part of the equation. We didn't even, it never occurred to me actually before now to, do, to use a pre-existing work. Um, <laughs> would have saved a lot of time. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, we did use it just in that it was important to make this work be very readable and immediately grabbing and just all the things you look for in a story. Um, you know, it's, it can be trouble when you're doing a work that's formally weird and narratively weird just on a, on a sentence level. Um, where for us this tension has played out mostly is whether the thing present itself as a book or as an ebook or as something else. I mean, so like that, the, the new world, which also exists as an app, seems to be very normal actually. And then as you get into it, it does some slightly weird things. This next thing that we're, that's coming out in the fall that we're working on, the pickle index, you have to even look to even find the book inside it. Uh, which maybe is a, is troubling, and but the, <laughs> but the thing is, I mean, what makes it so hard is that it's a it can be an obstacle if it's hard to figure out, and it can also be appealing if it's hard to figure. I mean, the kind of like what is this thing and something that presents itself as one thing and turned out like those are exciting things and kind of being plunked in this world and figuring out like in a gaming world is very familiar and is part of the fun, mm -hmm. and in so trying to figure out who's the user to make this thing for when actually there's all sorts of different users has been a challenge that we're still trying to figure out. Um, uh, uh, yeah, so I think that that's true, that it's um, like the type of audience uh, that is being drawn into these projects, um, um, like it makes a big difference. So um, like there's a lot of, um, so like being given this new, uh, this new way of consuming content and not knowing how to access it is um, a big hurdle. Um, it's like you're just like setting down a book on a table with a story and like, no one knows how to use this book. Um, so you have to have some kind of process of explaining the system to the reader first before they can access the content. Um, and if a person is coming at the project and expecting a game-like atmosphere, then people are very receptive to like a learning curve and like being slowly 
um, like introduced to the concepts of this project. Uh, but if they're coming at it and they think that it's like a book plus some weird gimmicks, uh, then they want to get like the first line of text immediately. Um, like they're not in the frame of mind that they're going to learn um, a new system. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I mean, as I said, but like gamers are I'm like so ready to have um, like a five minute tutorial. Yeah. Um, and so trying to figure out that like onboarding process of like here are like the sign up forms and now we're like leading you into the story and like this is how you find the first piece. Uh -huh. um, yeah, is one of the major challenges. It makes me think of the um, the famous uh, virtues of the first level of the first Super Mario Brothers game for the Nintendo, which is famous. If you haven't played it in a few years, which you might not have, uh, you should go back. You can like download it on your computer and stuff now. Um, uh, it, it's amazing. It actually, because Super Mario Brothers didn't like come with a manual, and there was no like games now are very sophisticated with their tutorials. It wasn't. It wasn't like welcome to Super Mario Brothers. Here's what you do. Um, but the level taught you how to play. Mm -hmm. It's actually this. It's it's still held out as like one of the greatest exemplars of this of this form, the game that teaches you how to play itself and it introduces one element at a time. It's really beautiful. So I actually, if you have any interest in video games or have an old Nintendo sitting around, just play that first level and it's to see how it, by the end of it, you're like, I know Mario Brothers. It's really <laughs> remarkable. Um, yeah, I mean, that's true, but I think that there's a problem. Like, um, like if that was presented to you as a book or like a new kind of book that was text, uh, then, uh, then you might play it for like five seconds and think, uh, this is like horribly made, like it's too difficult to use, and then you would just quit, mm -hmm. even though there is a process. So that like frame of mind, and it's hard, like we don't know how to present these things. Like, is it a book because it's mainly text? Um, is it a game because it's um, exploratory? Um, it's probably like a third uh, like new thing, but um, because we discussed earlier, there's not a good phrase for this yet uh, that people just get. Right. So it's right. Well, and there's there's a difference too. I I, th I think it's interesting. Again, I, there's just a productive and provocative kind of contrast here between um, Lithomobilis, which um, I mean it is a platform, and you're creating you're creating a framework. And I noticed I was using the app. I was kind of swipe. I learned the grammar pretty quickly, and once I learned the grammar, I could navigate all of the issues of this literary journal, and I kind of kind of got it in the way that you learn how to use the Facebook app or right. you know Instagram or whatever. You just said the Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Um, whereas, whereas you guys are building these bespoke apps, and each one is a new, a new model and a new system. Um, talk for a second about the, uh, you know, have you have you been tempted to build a platform, or or is the the fun of building a new thing every time precisely what makes this interesting to you? I do think. I mean, that basic question is one of the overarching things that's going on in this field right now, to the extent it's a field. Um, just so, I mean, do you, does everyone know? What the difference is, I mean, basically these have to be coded one at a time. The platform is basically a toolbox where someone without any programming yeah. skills can go in and, and populate it with their own story. And, presum and presumably the platform, I as a user, after I've, you know, read a couple books or whatever they are on this platform, I can, I, I can grok the rest of them immediately, mm -hmm. whereas the bespoke app model, each one, I'm like, okay, you know, as Russell said, time to, time to engage with this thing and, right. and learn its tricks right. anew. Yeah, I mean, they're both maybe a little doomed at the moment. <laughs> I mean, what we're doing is just too hard <laughs> and time consuming. Um, and definitely, if you know Russell wasn't involved, couldn't be done at all. And there's a, a real dearth of Russells in, in this field right now. Um, so I think platforms are definitely the way things need to be headed. Um, I'm just not sure we know yet as a culture what pl what we need in our platforms, what forms we like. Like, do we like the storage you have to walk around and f explore the story geographically? Do we like stories that are mostly about pickles, um, <laughs> or you know, or is it this sort, sort of nonlinear spinning off a central narrative? You know, what what do we want? And then you can make a platform that hopefully supports it all. Right now, most of the platform that I've seen. Um, you, as a creator, you quickly start to push up against the boundaries of it, and they're not made to support the thing. But definitely, it's where we need to be headed so that all you guys can be doing it, too. But do you think there's just going to be one platform? No. There'll be, like, six platforms. Yeah. But still, even what those six things are. Like, the way we have, like, you know, detective books, we have romance novels, we have literary... Like, these are forms that we understand. We understand what but, they should do. But it's not even that. It's like, we have magazines, and right. we have hardback books, yeah. and we picture have... Books. Yeah, books, yeah. pop-up books. Yeah, you know, books. Yeah. I, th I see it more yeah. like that. Yeah, yeah. no, I think that's a books. better analogy. Yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and also, I think like one thing is that um, um, like it's important to recognize that like we're not going to figure out a solution to this like in one step. It's going to take like a bunch of different projects and keep on um, um, like evolving those. Like no one like invented how like movies are made um, and distributed in like one leap in like a year. Uh, like no one invented the form of the novel and like the hardcover and then the paperback in one leap. It was like a whole series of like silly experiments and like some failed, some worked. Yeah. Um, so like I really see uh, the stuff that we're doing at least as not like an opinion that this is the way that things um, like should be or have to be, but it's like uh, like a series of like somewhat silly experiments. And like each time like 10% of those things we're learning, like maybe that worked and then moving forward, then we carry that out. That makes me think of uh, the history of film. Do you guys know the story of Thomas Edison and the Black Mariah? This was in the early, early days of film, the uh, kinetoscope. This was still the, the system and the machine they were using was called the kinetoscope. And uh, Edison was the kind of the prime exponent of this machine in this form. And he and his team had a tar paper shack in some town in New York, uh, in New York State, um, that uh, was called the Black Mariah. And apparently it was very uncomfortable in the summer. And they had their machine in there. And um, what they would do is just bring things and people in and put them in front of the camera because they didn't know what you were supposed to put in front of cameras yet. And it was like dancers and athletes and animals and these weird micro scenes of like, you know, behead, fake beheadings and, you know, seeing some history. And they were in there for 10 years. It was 10 years of just like, what do we do with this thing? And some of the film is still available online. You can look at these clips they made and they, they all seem ridiculous. I mean, they do seem like, like jokes or kind of, you know, trivialities, um, but it was really important. Oh, that's and how people will look back on our projects. But they'll speak of them with such, with such appreciation. Um, and, it's, and, it's and it's true, like, we're, we're, this world is, we're still in the Black Mariah. We're in the tar paper shack, like, putting, you know, ferrets with tiny trombones in front of the <laughs> kinetoscope. We're like, maybe that's it. <laughs> ferrets. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about I want to talk about access to this stuff um, because uh, so so we all love it um, and you guys probably mostly love it um, and I'm actually curious this is a little little um, quantitative question um, how many folks here have like iPhones or or i things um, and like Android phones too who does anyone not have a smartphone no smartphone users so we got some hands here. Um, so, I mean, I, I was a, a, a smartphone holdout um, for a while, uh, about a year ago, for about two years prior, I didn't have a smartphone. I was a meager act of resistance. And, um, but you had one before that? I had one before that, yeah. I had one before that, and then I, then I ditched it. Um, and I have one again now. But there are, the point is, there are people, for a variety of reasons, variety of reasons, don't have smartphones, don't have access to this kind of stuff. Um, whereas everybody, uh, most people, you know, they can get this at the public library and they can, they can make sense of this no matter how they fit into our society or kind of what, what platform they stand on. So I'm curious to know, um, does that bum you out? Uh, is it, is there, are there things we can do to answer that question of access? Uh, I'm, sure you, I'm sure you all have thoughts about that. Maybe we can start with you, Lise. Uh, you're making an app that's just, it's just an iOS app to start, right? It's just an iOS app now. So, so what do you think about that question of access? You know, it does bum me out because um, a lot of a lot of the contributors to non-binary review can't even see their stuff right now because they don't have an iOS device. And so, how much does it suck if you, as the author, can't like give your mom something to pin up on the refrigerator? You know, that's that's kind of crummy. Um, and and I really. Um, feel very deeply for people who just don't have the resources, don't have the means to get a device on, on which they can see this stuff. Um, and really, I'm a huge advocate for public libraries. I'm a huge advocate for better funding of public libraries because I feel like um, if, if people have access to the devices in a public library, they can still see this stuff in a public place and you know, be exposed to the technology that other people are using, become familiar with it, because I feel like just the ability to, to navigate devices that other people take for granted is one of those ways that we've you know, created this chasm between the haves and the have-nots. And I feel like um, you know, giving people access to all the technology, um, in in you know places that are free, places that are you know welcoming and that can help them build the kind of skills that a lot of other people take for granted is huge and give them access to the newest and the latest stories and modes of thought that are happening. 
Um, and, and that's really what I would love to see happen. And that's why all of our stuff is free. Right now, Let the Mobilist is free to download. Um, all of the non-binary review issues are free. Um, because I believe that, you know, you should be able to, everyone should be able to see this stuff. What about you, what about you Eli? Uh, I or Russell. Some, <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Oh, no, go ahead. Yeah, um, I do definitely agree that um, it's sad that people cannot um, access these. Um, and none of our stuff is available um, on um, Android just because we have limited resources. And like, the last thing I want to do after mm -hmm. spending like three years on making um, an app is sit down and rewrite it again. Yeah. Um, but then, like at the same time, it's not too like dissimilar from other like emerging art forms. Um, like back to um, like the movie examples, and like the people who could watch those very early movies at that time uh, were very limited. It's a phone. Um, <laughs> uh, were very limited. Uh, the same as books, like the first like printed books. Um, and like, while the art form was being figured out, then only a certain number of people could read it. Um, like back in the mid '90s, I used to make these like silly short movies that I would burn onto DVDs. Um, I, um, and I, one time, I went to visit uh, my grandmother, um, and she didn't have a DVD player, so I couldn't show her. Mm -hmm. uh, but yet, we think of like DVD players as being like um, a ubiquitous uh, thing. So it's it's definitely like it's sad and frustrating. But I'm not sure that there's like a precedent of how that um, it can be done in an easy way. Sure. And if, if that expectation exists, it, it's only because we, I think, too easily categorize these things we're talking about as ebooks, subcategory of books, and therefore want to apply the standard, the really remarkable standard of, of access and, right. and kind of mm -hmm. um, fluency that we have to books. But that's probably not appropriate because, as we've discussed, they're not. I mean, these are not just books on screens. They're a new thing that doesn't have a good name yet. Right. So yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I have just a couple more questions for these guys, but I'm going to ask for hands from the audience in a minute. So if you've got one of those great generative questions, um, get it ready. Um, I feel as if I've intimidated you now. Um, <laughs> the first question, the first question is always, whoever asks the first question will get a nod of approval from me. The first question in a room is always like, it breaks the ice, it breaks through, and then the floodgates are open and we're all getting smarter together. Um, I'm curious to, this is, this is going to be a little, a little nerdy maybe kind of in the weeds, but I'm actually just curious to know about um, the fact that this exists um, for all of your books so far, The Silent History, The New World, and, and The Pickle Index as well. You guys have done this really interesting thing that um, I, think, I think is unique or, or close to it, where you've got these path-breaking apps that tell stories in interesting ways, um, but you also work with like the best publisher, uh, Faris Dress and Giroux, to um, produce these really lovely um, print editions of the books that, of course, solve all these problems of access and fluency and everything else. And I'd just be curious to know, like, um, was that part of the plan from the beginning? How does the translation work? Uh, I don't know. Just is that and it, sure. is it a path that you encourage for other folks trying to do this work? Well, it's been pretty random. Um, in each case, there have been <laughs> two and soon to be three cases, and each one's been different. So silent history never considered as print at all. It was very important that we didn't envision it that way because at that time, like 2011 or whatever, it was more like you had a print book and then you put some bells and whistles on it to make a digital book and I wanted to very much distinguish it from that. So it was a digital novel. We didn't have any ulterior motives, didn't have any future plans. Then I guess it kind of did well, got some attention and then this editor who's also Robin's editor at FSG, Sean McDonald, who's able to sort of work within that traditional publishing environment, but nudge them forward, said like, I'd like to publish it. And then we said, fine. Um, and you know, we re-edited it and streamlined it a little bit. Um, I'm glad it exists, I'm proud of it, but it wasn't part of it conceptually. For this one, the new world that came out as an app, um, <laughs> whatever, like six months ago, and then did print just recently, it was similar, it was random, but then, but it's nice because then the company that put it out digitally folded like two weeks after publication and um, so it print, it doesn't matter if FSG folds because it exists, which is, seems arbitrary, but is a relevant advantage of print. Yeah. For the next one though, the Pickle Index, for that one actually it's coming out simultaneously as an app, as a mass market paperback, and as a fancy hardcover. And it's to really try and do something interesting with each form inherent to the advantages and limitations of that form. And also so that you're know, getting back to that question of access, not just access, but also just like 
some people, myself kind of included, don't really feel like reading an ebook. Um, you actually like just reading a book. So to really treat all of those as interesting, evolving technologies and um, have them all kind of hit at once and yeah. nothing be an afterthought or, or um, ahead of the other. So that, so it's still evolving. I, this is the first one I actually care about. <laughs> those are nice, I'm glad they exist. I'm glad, but it's not conceptually yeah. important. This, sure. this I'm, I'm excited about it for artistic reasons. Uh, Lise, what about you? Do you think there's a print uh, future? Is that something that you're thinking about or excited about, creating some sort of print analog to the to the non-binary review or, or any other part of the project? So we actually have. Um, we have some paper editions of selections from our first year of non-binary review. Um, and we did that in part to give some of our contributors, you know, something to pin up on the fridge. Um, and those are for sale at our booth. Um, I, I like the notion of print, um, but there are, th there are things inherent to our platform that make print impractical. Um, you know, I suppose if we wanted to, it would end up looking sort of like a choose your own adventure thing, which is great and fine and a, and a swell thing, um, but, you know, a pain in the neck and has already been done, you know, has already been solved. Um, and I feel like, I also, you know, kind of like reading for straight linear text. I like reading paper books. I still do that. I also am completely in love with audiobooks. Um, you know, I spend a lot of time in the car, and so I hate that time to be wasted. So I listen to audiobooks all the time. Again, um, best for straight linear books. Um, but like I said, I'm really looking for the person who's going to, you know, make some shocking, surprising, cool use of our platform. And the platform right now, um, we are this close, I would say by the end of the summer, we will have the authoring and publishing tools um, done so that anyone can create um, these nonlinear texts um, and create them in, in super flexible ways. That's exciting. Yeah. That's exciting. Just building on what Leach was saying, um, yeah, these things are inherently um, if it's easy to translate into print, it, you're probably not doing a good enough job with your digital book. Sure. Um, so for those, for silent history in the new world, we kind of stripped out some things and hopefully it still works as a straight narrative. Um, so for the next one, it was to try and imagine Tor of C as two forking paths. It could take a digital form or it could take a print form. But um, yeah, it shouldn't be an easy decision to just uh, put, uh, hit Apple P and then yeah. we have our, our <laughs> book. That's great. Know. I like that. That's a good standard. If you can, if you can just print it out, you're not, you're doing it wrong. Um, okay. What questions do you guys have? I'll open it up to the floor. First hand, right back there. Here's your nod of approval. <laughs> um, yeah. Well, this is sort of building on what you're just talking about. But um, so in some of these examples, it's obvious why it uh, benefits from a new platform. For example, if there's a game component, um, but you're also talking about, you know, nonlinear narratives. Uh, can really thrive with new unusual platforms. And I know part of the point is that it opens it up to you know, innovative and flexible and new ideas, but what are some kind of recurring types of narratives or story features that you have seen that you know, couldn't exist without a new tech platform or you think really benefit from a new platform? So um, one of, the, one of the things that we talked about early on at our offices when we were creating this platform, let's say you're a student and you have to write a paper about World War II. Um, and history books are big and there's a lot in them and you can pour over a history book and try to find the things that you're looking for, but what if in your history book you could say, I just want to find out all the things that happened in the Pacific Theater of Action. Okay, I can just look at that and I can just filter on that particular thing and only get that part of the story. What if you only wanted to find out the things that happened on February 2nd, 1941? You can just look at that and you can see, you know, every theater of action, every person, you know, every major figure and find out that whole day. What if you just wanted to find out, you know, what Douglas MacArthur's part in the, in the war was? You can just look at his bit. Um, so there are ways of pivoting the content so that it is individual to you. Um, <coughs> similarly, um, in any kind of big textbook, you know, if you, if you have a big law textbook and you just want to find out about tort reform, great, I can just pivot on that and look at just that. 
Um, there are books out now, like anyone who has read the um, Song of Ice and Fire series, the Game of Thrones books, um, those are written um, with, with um, you know, one point of view at a time. So you'll have this person's point of view and tells a story, and then you go back to this point in time and this person's point of view. And what if you only want to want to read Daenerys's point of view? What if you only want to read her story? Well, then just read her story, and you don't have to wade through all the other stuff that you care less about. Um, so there are lots of people writing in in this way now. You know, Stephen King wrote The Stand in a way that would that would super you know that would benefit from this thing now. Um, but there, are, like I said, there are, are texts that have yet to be written. Um, that will that will do even cooler things. That sort of text as database that you can run a query against. Exactly. Um, uh, yeah. So I think as well, like uh, the context uh, that these mobile devices give us um, uh, can be used um, in very interesting ways. Uh, so when you read like a printed book, um, it's often like removing you from. Uh, your environment, uh, like you're at home, it's quiet, or um, like uh, you're riding the bus and you're kind of taking yourself um, like outside of the um, like outside of uh, the situation and like immersing yourself in the story. Uh, but these like smartphones and devices that we have on us the whole time and can tell like, various things about uh, your current environment and serve up like bite-sized chunks of stories um, is very interesting. Um, so there's an example. There's um, uh, like an app that came out a few months ago uh, called Karen, which is a video-based app. Um, and, and, like, and the premise is that you're having a series of like video calls with um, a life coach. And the story kind of um, like takes a weird twist. Um, but like the timing that these video calls comes in, which is, like, um, is based in your local time zone, has a big impact on the story. Uh, so like at some point, you get a call. Uh, from Karen um, at like 11 p.m. and she's um, in a bar and is asking you some questions. And then you get like a follow-up call um, at like 7 a.m. the next morning and, she, um, like, and she tells you what happens to her that night. Um, like in that time, is not, um, it, um, um, it's not like reading about a person who is in a bar and you're reading about it like, well, you're going to work in the morning. Like uh, the time is, um, like is in your time zone, is your time. Um, and things um, like uh, like in the silent history, we had um, a location-based element where you would walk and read like, these very short stories based on a specific street corner, and it would involve things that you could see, like uh, like a mark in a red door or a chain link fence that the characters would come and shake. Um, yeah, so just really building on like the context that these uh, that these devices that we carry around with us the whole time uh, can figure out. Right, right there. I bet you would know, but I bet there's platforms that kind of do that right now. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there are, there definitely are some platforms. I think they're, um, they're not very good yet. I think you've actually posed a, a pretty big unsolved challenge. Um, you know, you know, there's things that, um, there's things that are very explicitly book clubs online, which are, which are actually powerful, but you know, we kind of know what that mode is like. There's also, of course, what we see on the e-readers, the sort of shared highlights, which um, some people consider the bane of, of you know, private reading. But also, they can give you a sense. I, I think they can be lovely sometimes. They give you a sense of this sort of ghostly you know, halo of all the other readers surrounding a book. And it be, can be quite cool to see you know, even evidence of some specific people you know. But um, that question of like, what's the new, because those, those are both you know, new interpretations of things that we understand. We know what it means to highlight a book. We know what it means to have a book club conversation where like, I thought the characters were quite interesting or whatever. Um, a plus. Um, and, but what's the new thing, right? What's the new kind of social context around a book that, uh, that wasn't possible before? I think, so your question is a good one and people should be working harder to solve it. I think one possible answer might connect to something that 
Russell said about these things pinned to places. Um, the idea that you could have stories that have that geographic context and um, people can add to that themselves or kind of, and of course people are trying this. So far it's not been successful. I, I know something about this, Robin. <laughs> Please. Uh, I was hired wait, wait. a while ago by a, a, fund, a startup funded by Google to heavily annotate literature um, to add additional of content. Yeah, of course I was. <laughs> to, to, you know, go into the Hunger Games book and put in video footage <coughs> existed of people creating the recipes that are in the book and to put in all sorts of video and in websites and, and every kind of content. But then the readers who bought the book through that application could all communicate with each other as they were reading in marginalia within the book itself and could add their own content, whether it was fan-created artwork or links to something else or just have side conversations within the book when it was read through that app. Something, something, let me just say quickly. There's something lovely. It's it's chaotic, but like the idea of book as as corkboard with all these crazy things pinned to it. There's something kind of lovely about that, isn't there? Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. And we were at BEA last last week, and um, there actually are many startups right now that are solving exactly that problem um, of how to how to get social into books. And like, do we integrate Facebook because Facebook is already a thing that everybody uses and therefore knows? Or do we, like how how social is social? Do you just want your class? You know, you're a professor. Do you want your class to be able to talk about a book? Do you want everybody who is reading the book be able to talk about it at the same time? So there are companies absolutely that are that are solving for various iterations of that. But there's also this whole community of people that say, no, really, when I read a book, it's like going to the bathroom. I want to be alone. It's not something I'm sharing with people. You know, I just this is my own private experience. Yeah. Um, and and so and so there are people who are super resistant. But I think that you know, as with you know, saying what is going to be the right platform, there isn't a right platform. You know, everybody is going to find that thing that they that they want. Okay, we only have a few minutes left, so we'll get a few more questions in there. Oh, three tray minutos, and we're this this festival is so on time uh, in the in the sort of red red sweater yeah. there. Uh, so you, you talked about how this is sort of this creative experimentation, you know, like all this kind of movie thing. Do you see sort of a broadly comprehensible platform for that like society can sort of understand what's going on emerging, or is this the type of thing that like is always going to be subject to sort of like a higher like learning curve that it's going to like take more effort? Yeah, um, I think uh, sort of comparing it to the games industry, which uh, was uh, like very um, incomprehensible to many people, uh, required a lot um, of like specialist um, hardware that people did not have. Um, I'm like, and has now developed into um, a mindset where even though like a lot of these projects are very, very different from like first person shooters to like um, experimental indie games uh, that tell a very personal story, um, and like the collective mindset has developed where they um, are more accessible. Uh, so I think that it will get to that point. Yeah, I mean, another way to say that is these are projects that are inherently the form has an equal footing as the content. And um, so as people develop a consciousness of that as part of the experience is learning the form the same way you learn who are the characters, where is the story going, you'll be inherently prepared to deal with these things. Because they're not hard. It's just if you expect it to be invisible, then they're hard. And all that sort of a, a sort of a, I can never remember the difference between positive and normative. I think a, a normative answer. Um, uh, let's hope that even as those literacies and those modes emerge, it doesn't coalesce into the model we're seeing with so much, so many things online, where it's the big, you know, mothership in, that sort of contains all the Facebook or the Google or whatever, or the Apple ecosystem or whatever. I think it would be so much more interesting, so much healthier even as conventions emerge, um, for it to be more like publishing, actually, um, a confederation of small players, really something that's still somehow more cottage industry than hyper-capitalism. Like, that would be that would be good, I think, for, for these The projects. reason to be depressed right now is that publishers aren't doing that. Um, they're waiting. They're either doing nothing or they're just looking for yeah, a giant waiting, mothership. Yeah, they're waiting for the Facebook of, of e-reading. Sorry to end um, up. Yeah. Someone asked, can I ask the positive no, thing? No, really the positive it? thing. The, posi the positive <laughs> thing is these projects are awesome. You got to check out the Silent History of the New World soon, the Pickle Index, um, and uh, you got to check out the non-binary review too. You guys have you guys have a uh, uh, 
booth here. We do. Okay, so you can go and say hi to Lise. Thank you all so much for coming out. And thanks to my panelists.